thank you, Dave. Um, hello, everyone. So before I start with SPPL, if you have any questions or doubts with regards to STL with the operators, uh, we can address them now because we'll be using them uh, while I explain STP. If we are good with that, I can go ahead. So autonomous vehicles um, are, become an, um, are, are becoming an, we are adopting it continuously. We are adopting it more and more. They're becoming an integral part of our lives. And it doesn't have to be a completely self-driving car. You know, parts of it being automated are also some steps towards autonomy. And while we go towards that automation, while we achieve that dream of automation, um, we need to consider that we need to consider the safety aspect of it. Um, I have three examples here, which some, uh, one of them has been fatal to human life, other two can be fatal to human life. So this uh, autonomous vehicles are safety critical systems. What do I mean by safety critical systems? Uh, they are systems whose failure can cause uh, catastrophic damage to both human lives and machineries. Um, and uh, this we need to basically build. Um, so the entire premise here is that um, autonomous drive, we need to make autonomous driving safe. Now, what this paper does is it deals with the perception system. Um, anyone who has dealt with any kind of perception system knows that uh, this is the most basic building block of the entire autonomous driving framework. Uh, you might ask why? Because it basically helps you how map how your surrounding looks like. Uh, for example, um, the graph that I have here basically gives a bird eye, bird eye view in the mainframe. And then if this is the ego car, it shows you the front, the back and the two sides. So like, we are able to map how our surrounding looks like with this perception module. And there are many algorithms that can help us do that. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. So the main premise here is that we, we do have general metrics on how our perception modules work, how, how good they are, how bad they are. But can we go ahead and comment about how safe they are? So if we have, uh, if we have like a system uh, which we have already built, we have trained a model, we have a good model, good accuracies, good, everything is fine. Now can we comment about how safe they are in terms of, you know, what our objective is? Um, and the million dollar question here is, um, can, we, can we have metrics that can comment about the safety of the underlying perception system? Um, and that's where the authors come up with something called the spatio-temporal perception logic. Now what spatio-temporal perception logic does is that it deals with videos. So you have a perception module, you have videos, you do object tracking, you do object estimation, um, you keep track of everything that's happening. And then say, well, um, how well has, um, how safely has my perception model performed over the videos? To give you an example, uh, uh, we have like three frames of the sequence here from the KT data set. And if this is, a, if we detect a cyclist here, it shouldn't be tagged as pedestrian. And it should always keep tagging it as cyclist, which is what we get. Uh, and at this point, there's no cyclist as pedestrian. So the perception model might have worked well, but it hasn't, it, it's not really safe to put in autonomous driving framework because it's constantly uh, converting a pedestrian to cyclist and cyclist to pedestrian. This is what led to the crash about the Uber that we talked about earlier. So what STPL does is that it takes in the objects that are identified in a particular video, the classes and their corresponding categories for every frame, uh, their assigned IDs, and we basically try to define logic over this data stream in terms of spatio, the first term of this, um, uh, this logic framework. So what spatio means is we are dealing with bounding boxes and areas in the images. And what perception means is we are dealing with objects and how they move or how they are tracked in a particular framework. Um, so if there's a video of tau seconds and has F frameworks, uh, sorry, S and has F frames, um, and if DI refers to the i frame in a video, um, I just want to give an example. So if you have like this particular frame in a video, this is the first frame and it corresponds to the time 0 0.04. Uh, we assume that our uh, perception model gives us the following things. The classes in a particular frame. So here we have three different classes, a car, a cyclist, and a pedestrian. So we have three different classes assigned to it. Then we have um, or information of what every class refers to. So in this particular case, 
The second class is basically the cyclist and we call it the cyclist. And we have a perception module that does that for us. Um, then it's probability of being a cyclist and the time that corresponding that that particular frame corresponds to. So these are the assumptions that we uh, that STPL assumes that we get from the perception model. Um, so let's get into uh, some warm up questions. <laughs> Why I say warm up? Because this, um, these are some easy ones that uh, that I took from uh, the thesis by one of the students at ASU. Um, and um, let's see. So for all objects detected in a particular frame, or uh, on any, uh, let's just say for all objects detected. The area of the bounding box is greater than or equal to 5.0. If anyone wants to take a hint at solving it, you could do that, or I can give you some hints. So we have like three different components here. Uh, the first part is for all object. So that basically gives us a set of all the objects in a particular frame. And we have something called the area of object. So how the perception module does gives it gives us bounding boxes and that helps us calculate the area. So we have like the two main ingredients. We know the objects, we know the areas of bounding boxes. Does anyone want to take a hint? I think it's fairly straightforward. Uh, anyone? Uh, easy, right? So what you are saying here is for all objects, we basically have the area of object greater than five. Now, some might get confused between what OBJ actually means. It's basically, so for all, it's like a quantifier and we're iterating over elements in the set OBJ. And then the set OBJ corresponds to items in a particular frame. So what we're saying here is for all objects, area of object greater than five. Um, we have a second warm up question here, which is on the similar line, which says that always there exists an object that has confidence value greater than or equal to 0 0.0, 0 0.65. So the hints here are, um, we have an always operator because that's what the requirement asked us to do. Um, then we have there exists an object because we are, we are just talking about one single object. It, we just need the existence of one single object. We don't need any forum. And then the third end is the area. Oh, okay, I think there's a type for you. But what I meant is it should be probability of object. And we have this particular specification which says that uh, I think there's some type. So it basically should be there exists objects as the probability of object greater than 0 0.65. Are okay, we good with that? Always should be perfect. Always uh, there exists. Yes, I don't know why. Okay. I'm sorry for that. But yeah, there should be an always. Um, should I write it down here? No, And there should be an existential. Yeah, problem. there should be an existential, I think. No. And then the third warm up question is it's the same as the first one where we are dealing with areas and we are dealing with bounding boxes. And now we are just saying that for all objects detected in the second frame particularly, um, how do we deal uh, the area of the bounding box is greater than or equal to uh, five. So now what we had is, uh, if you notice, we need a way to freeze time or a frame, uh, specifically the second frame. Um, so how the STPL language deals with it is using this specific uh, notation. So what it says is um, for all objects at a particular time x. So x. So if you go into the monitoring language, if you go into the backend, x basically is a dictionary which has both frame and time information. So it could it, it basically takes information based on the context. But here, what here what I want you to tell, what, what I want you guys to take away is that it's basically saying for all objects at a particular frame x. And then how do we go, how do we formulate our next requirement? We say that for all of the, for all objects at a particular frame x, uh, x equals equal to two because we are dealing with the second frame and the area of the object greater than five. Um, do this make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, let's take a hint at grammar now. <laughs> so uh, the grammar is pretty complex. But uh, let's go step by step. Uh, since I've taken images, uh, they're a little bit scattered. But let's just deal at the first block. So the first block basically gives you a grammar or syntax about uh, how do we how do we freeze time. This is the second one. There exists ID at particular X at particular frame. Then you have the Boolean operators. You have the next operator. You have the until operator. 
Then Tao basically deals with time. So you can you basically have constraints in form of time where you say that Tau minus current time is greater than a particular t. The similar constraint is there in frames as well. Um, and then I think it's pretty included the first block. Now what the second block says, the capital Tau, it's basically dealing with space. Uh, I mean, if you if you just take your minds of these symbols and just try to understand it. Um, if there's a space, if you have a particular rectangle box and you have a circle in between it, so anything inside it is basically tau. So the complement of capital tau will be anything outside the circle. Okay. Uh, then you have the union of spaces, you have the interior of spaces, then, and then you have temporal operators over spaces. Um, to make more sense out of this, I have a figure here which basically says that Look at the first uh, four frames from A to D. So you have a rectangle which moves, keeps moving around. And if you have an operator which says always over all of these four frames, you're going to get you're going to get the union of everything. Because remember, always, always deals with the always operator, always deals with it should be valid every time. So that's why you get like a union, which is this part. However, if there's an eventually, we'll basically take the union of all the uh, areas that were covered. And that's why you have a large area. So this is how the capital tau works. It's basically syntax over temporal and spatial, uh, spatial and temporal constraints. Then if you come back, if you come below, it deals with areas. So what area says is areas in an image. They can be with respect to bounding boxes. They can be with respect to areas, uh, spaces in a particular frame. You, if you look into this, they are basically latitude with respect to certain um, <coughs> points in a particular frame. So how they name it is, there are four corners in the frame which say leftmost, topmost, bottommost, and rightmost. And then you can define grammar over those particular points. Um, and this is how the grammar overall looks like. Um, it might seem very complex, but um, I think in order to just get the gist of it, uh, I think everyone like, everyone gets what's happening here. Uh, but the main things I want you to take away is um, how the spaces work and how the how the areas work, how the spaces work, and the the key operators in the first uh, part.